Welcome to this recorded webinar on active listening and barrier games with speech and language therapists from Bromley Healthcare. So first of all, we're going to talk about what active listening is, starting with a definition from specialist speech and language therapist within this area, Maggie Johnson. So what is active listening? An active listener is someone who realises that messages cannot always be understood and takes responsibility for seeking clarification when confused, stuck or unsure. So in a nutshell, it's supporting children and young people to recognise that they have not understood completely and to learn how to indicate when there is a problem. And for us supporting adults to create an environment in which it is okay to not understand. So how do we identify difficulties with active listening? Thinking about the definition of active listening that we just went through, take a moment to think about some of the children you may work with. How would you know if they were having difficulties with active listening? What might this look like? What behaviours you might see? You may want to pause the video here whilst you have a think about this. These are some of the things you may notice. Difficulty following instructions. The child may sit at their desk and not start writing anything. The child tries to copy others. The child does not ask for help. And they may have difficulty answering questions about information that was given to them verbally. For example, a story. An example might be a child who's in year three. They might be well behaved, adept at copying peers and getting by, but is struggling to make progress. They may just sit and nod when asked, do you understand? This is the child that is often presenting with language difficulties. So this is just a really simple example of a support that you can use with children within your classrooms to help them indicate that they have or haven't understood what they need to do. So you can have these on their desk or in their tray and the green card is for them to indicate when they have understood what they need to do and the red card they can use if they haven't understood and they need help. So they can either just place it on their table or they can hold it up um, and it's just a quite subtle but easy way for them to indicate if they need help or not. You can also introduce a yellow card, um, which is kind of an in-between. So if they're not sure if they need help or not, and you might just need to go over and just check in with them. These visuals are particularly useful for children who find it difficult or do not like putting their hand up to ask for help and need something a bit more subtle. So this resource is also based on Maggie Johnson's active listening strategies and it's a slightly more complex way of asking for help. So the child is providing specific detail or information on why they haven't understood. So for older or more able children, we can teach them that there are lots of reasons why we might not understand something. So for example, a teacher may have said something too quietly, too quickly, they might have given a really long instruction. They might have used a word, a tricky word that that child doesn't understand. And that child needs to figure out why they haven't understood. And in that way, they can seek specific clarification. So if they um, have realised that there was a word that was used that they didn't understand, they could ask, what does that word mean? So it's a three-step process this time. So the child needs to identify that they haven't understood, first of all identify why they haven't understood and then ask something specific to rectify this. So basically seek specific clarification. So as we said previously, younger children or those with more additional needs um, might not be able to do this just yet and they might need to just stick to either using the red or green cards or just a simple kind of phrase that they say each time they haven't understood. So can you help me please or I don't know. So to practice asking for specific clarification or specific help, you can use this visual in small group activities. So the adult working with the group of children would give the child an instruction that's deliberately difficult to follow. So for example, deliberately saying it too quickly, deliberately saying it too um, quietly, using a word that you know the child won't understand and see if the child can identify first that they haven't understood, then that why they haven't understood and then therefore ask the question that they need to ask in order to help themselves understand. 
So it's helping the child to realise that if they seek clarification, they will then be able to follow that instruction correctly. So as an example on this um, selection of pictures, if you said to the child, please, can you point to the trilby? And that child would say, oh, what does a trilby mean? Or what does trilby mean? You would say, oh, it's a type of hat. And then that child would then be able to point to the right picture. So it helps them to realise that if they ask for help, it helps them then continue with what they need to do. As well as demonstrating active listening through seeking clarification, there are also lots of other ways that you can support children's attention and listening in the classroom generally. So chunking, which basically means splitting long instructions up into manageable tr chunks, and a child is more likely to listen and follow that instruction if they're more manageable for them. Repeating instructions, so being prepared to say the instruction or activity more than once, especially if the child has found it difficult to listen actively the first time. Using visuals, so symbols, pictures, writing down key words, and that also involves the visual memory. So it makes what you're saying more interesting and therefore more likely to grab the child's attention. And it also reduces that pressure on auditory memory. Using signs or gestures, so Makaton signs, for example, or just the natural gestures that we all do alongside our talking, using gesture for abstract concepts. So for example, to indicate size or location, pointing. Um, so as we said before, it just uses that visual memory to help the child remember the instruction and listen. Using multisensory teaching, so kinesthetic learning, learning by doing, moving around while learning, touching the objects being learned about. Taking notes, so for older children particularly who are able to do this, encouraging them to take notes that they can refer back to to support their listening and memory. Using visuals for seeking clarification as we've already gone through um, and a traffic light system as previously mentioned as well. So useful for children who aren't keen on putting their hand up for ask for help. They could show a green card or a red card to indicate that they have or haven't understood. It's important to note actually that there is a way of speaking to children and giving instructions that is going to help all children in the class, not just children who have difficulties with language or with their attention and listening. So pausing, repeating the key points um, is going to help all, all children understand what they need to do. And it also means that one particular child who's finding it difficult isn't singled, isn't singled out as a child who's really finding things tricky. These are just a few more general strategies that you can use with children in the classroom to support their active listening. Um, so using good looking and good listening prompts and visuals, praising the children for when they do show good looking or good listening. So picking up the positives rather than telling them what they shouldn't do. Keeping your activities short and structured, possibly using a visual task organiser to show each part of the activity that the child has to do. So for example, number one, write a sentence, number two, colouring, number three, sticking in. And then the child can tick off each bit after they've done it. Involving the children in the lessons in an active way. So for example, simple things like helping you turn the page of a book, being a helper, ticking something off on the whiteboard... Um, and just letting children who are finding it tricky have frequent but brief movement breaks. Um, for example, collecting pencils or taking a message to another classroom if you need a message delivering. Um, some children do benefit from having something to touch or fiddle with while they're being taught, and it just helps them keep their focus and channel their energy. So, for example, a squeezy ball or a soft piece of Velcro stuck to their desk just for them to touch. Trying to involve parents as much as you can. So having a contact book that goes to, or from, to and from school to communicate with the parents so that you can let them know how they've been getting on at school. They can let you, uh, let you know how they've been getting on at home and if they have had a particularly good or bad day. And also it's just a really nice way of sharing reward systems. So like sticker charts, um, which can be consolidated in both environments. 
If the child does ask for help, making sure that you give them praise for that as well. So well done for asking me or well done for telling me that you weren't sure. Um, and it's also quite useful to give the child to um, give the child something specific to listen out for while you're talking. So um, in this story, I want you to listen out for where the girl lives and then they know what they're listening for. Something else that we're going to talk a bit more about later is whole body listening. So helping the child to know how to listen, exactly what it is you want them to do in order to listen more. So listen with your eyes or your ears. We'll talk a bit more about this later. So Becca has mentioned some ways to encourage children to listen and understand what is being said. And one of the most effective ways we can help is by providing visual support, such as visual timetables. Visual support is helpful, however, if there are too many pictures, words and symbols, the visuals can seem confusing. How many people have attempted to follow visual instructions in explaining how to put flat pack furniture together? The clearest visuals have pictures, symbols, which encourage left to right reading. This is important for preschool children too, as it prepares them for reading and scanning left to right. This is true for timetables, worksheets and presentations. Setting out tables as a book is clearer than one long detailed list. So factors which contribute to engagement are motivation, content and delivery. As well as giving students the skills to become active listeners, as teachers and as therapists, we also need to look at our role. What could I do to improve the child's attention or how could I make this easier? It's not always about entertainment. This is different from it being enjoyable. It has to be enjoyable, but it doesn't always have to be entertaining. We need to think about how to engage students and how they can succeed. The National Curriculum says that each pupil needs a challenge. This is only affected if the child knows they will succeed. Motivation isn't only based on enjoyment. It's much more to do with achievement and feeling good about ourselves because the child has been able to meet the goal and successfully complete the task. It's important that the child also knows what the task looked like the destination and how to get there, so the steps that we need. For example, adults need to see the journey on Google Maps, not just the destination, or the slides that are going to form the presentation. On this slide, we can see an example of a task management board. So on the top left-hand corner, we have what is the task, and the right top-hand corner, what equipment is needed, as well as the steps. We also have the challenge, so what's expected, and then thinking about what do we need, What do I need to do and what happens after that? So we need to listen with our whole body. That's our ears, our eyes, mouth, hands, feet, body, heart and brain. Some of you may already be aware of the idea of whole body listening from the Michelle Garcia Winner um, Social Thinking Programme. This encourages students to think not just about what they need to do with their ears, but how other parts of their body are also involved when we listen. So the poster you may have heard us reference before, the whole body listening poster with Listening Larry, has all the different areas of the body laid out clearly in a visual to demonstrate what parts need to um, help support the child when they are doing sort of active listening. So we have the eyes, which is making sure you're looking at the person when you're talking to them. Ears, both ears are ready to listen. Mouth equals quiet, no talking, humming or making any sounds. Hands, keeping them quiet, no tapping in your pockets or by by your side. Or even for some of our children, they may need a sensory toy. Um, Feet, quiet on the floor. Body, facing the speaker. Brain, so that's switched on and thinking about what is being said. And heart, um, which is about caring about what the other person is saying. So another area that the child needs to be aware of to help support active listening is brain and body in the group. Again, this is kind of linked to Michelle Garcia winner. So body in the group, your body is physically in the group, the same space as others in the group. For example, you're sitting around a table with your group. Brain in the group is your brain is thinking about the topic and what other people are saying. Your body may be physically in the group, but this does not mean that your brain is. A practical activity that you can do to help with brain in the group is using Play-Doh with the whole class poster with removable brains 
all brains inside a circle representing the group and the teacher or key worker can move the brains out to indicate if someone's brain has left the group. This helps the child to physically see and visually see when their brain or their thoughts have left the group. This can be a helpful prompt when children start talking about different subjects or whose thoughts seem to be somewhere else. On this slide, there's a list of games and activities for the classroom for developing attention and listening. There should either be a link uploaded with this attachment or contact your local speech therapist for a copy of these games. So also within teaching, we want to give children a reason to listen. Rather than start reading a story or watching a video clip or presenting information on a topic, we might set questions before reading the story or watching the video or ask children to tick off words, pictures as they listen. So for example, we might say we're going to watch a video about the Great Fire of London. Can you find out X, Y, Z or have some keywords, pictures on a sheet and the children will tick those off as they see the picture or hear the word. So now we're going to go into a bit more detail about what barrier games are and how you can use a barrier game to help a child to work on all areas of their speech, language and or communication. So a barrier game is a game in which two players sit across from each other at a table and they have a barrier in between them. So that's just anything that means that one player can't see what the other player is doing. So it could just be something simple like a book that you stand up between the two players. Both players are then given the same scene and pieces to go with it and they take turns to give instructions to the other player. And then the aim is to end up with matching scenes at the end when the barrier is removed. So as I mentioned, barrier games can be used to work on all areas of a child's communication. So receptive language or their understanding, expressive language or talking, social communication, active listening and seeking clarification and speech sounds. Using a barrier game to work on a child's receptive or expressive language would involve either listening to, understanding and following instructions or listening to descriptions, so that's your receptive language part or your understanding of language, or giving instructions or describing, so that's your expressive or spoken language part. So looking at use of vocabulary, putting these words into sentences, getting your words in the right order so that your listener can follow what it is that you're describing or your instruction. You can use barrier games to support a child's understanding and use of keyword instructions. So just to give you an example, an instruction with one keyword would be something like, give me the cup, for example. So although there's four words in that instruction, there's only one keyword. So if there was a selection of objects on the table and you said, give me the cup, then that child only has to understand that word cup in order to follow the instruction. An example of an instruction that's got two keywords might be if you had a selection of toy pretend food on the table and a selection of animals and you said give the apple to the pig or give the banana to the horse. So although there's a few words in that instruction overall, there are only two keywords and that is the food and the right animal. You can use barrier games to look at a child's understanding of keyword instructions, either with real toys or objects or paper-based resources. And we're going to show you a couple of examples of these now. This is an example of a simple keyword activity using real toys or real objects. So each player would need to have all the same toys. And then you take turns to give each other an instruction. So put the penguin on the sofa or put the doll on the chair and then the other person has to follow. This is an example of a paper-based barrier game. So each child taking part in the barrier game would need to have a copy of the coloured cars and then one of the two boards to the right of those. So the children would then take turns to give each other an instruction. So for example, put the little red car on the flowers or put the big green car on the fish. 
So one person would give the instruction and the other person would have to listen and follow the instruction and both players would then place their car in the right place. That particular example had three keywords, so you need to get the right colour, the right size and put it in the right place, but you could make it less or more challenging depending on the child's level. So if you wanted an instruction that only had two keywords, you could only have one colour of car, so you could say put the big car on the pig or the little car on the fish, so it's just the right size and the right place to put it. Or you could make it more challenging by adding another object so, for example, you could also have different coloured teddies and then you would ask, put the big red teddy on the fish or put the little blue car on the shoe. You can incorporate barrier games into um, work on any class-based concepts that you're working on. So, for example, shape. So this is just an example of a board that you could use for practising shapes. So an example of an instruction might be put the blue counter on the yellow triangle or put the yellow counter on the green circle. Here we have another example of a paper-based resource. So again, each player would have the, a copy of the same picture and take turns to give each other an instruction. So for example, for the second picture, you could say, cross out the spider on the witch's hat or draw three red spots on the door. And then the other person has to follow that instruction. Or for the first example here, you could give an instruction such as colour the big monster's balloon red or colour the little teddy's boots green. So that's an example of a four keyword instruction. So you need to get the right colour, the right size, the right character and the right part of its body. For children who are finding this difficult, visual support is going to be a really helpful way to help them structure their instruction and remember to use all of the keywords that they need to use for the listener to follow that instruction accurately. So there's just a couple of examples of visual support that you can use here. The child might like to point to each of the words as they say them and that could help them include all of those key bits of information. Another example here of a paper-based resource that you can use more for describing rather than giving an instruction per se. So each person in this game would have a slightly different picture, so it's a spot the difference activity. So one player would have the picture on the left and the other player would have the picture on the right and then you would take turns to describe something about your picture. So for example, on my picture I can see a frog jumping out of the water on the left hand side of the kangaroo. And then the listener has to look at their own picture and decide if theirs is the same or different. And if it's different, describe how it's different. So another good um, barrier game is free drawing. Um, so this is where you take it in turns to give an instruction to each other with the aim being to create matching pictures. So you might want to put like a folder up between you or some form of barrier so you can't see each other. This activity tends to be good for older children um, and possibly with uh, better language skills. This way you can also target key vocabulary and concepts. So for example, positional language, um, so like above or below, left or right, different shapes or topic vocabulary. So other games that you can use are grid games. So these are squares that can be numbered and the children or young people can take turns to listen and then give directions. So for example, draw a snake in box eight. Um, these can start off simple and um, when you're working on vocabulary and you can get harder. Harder instructions would be you would use coordinates. So draw a snake in square A2. You might want to do this with older children and it's similar to uh, the game of battleships. So barrier games can also be used to support children with social communication difficulties. So this might be to help them interact with peers in a structured activity, to take turns, to wait, social perspective taking, functional social phrases, and specific social skills such as maybe eye contact, listener awareness, the positioning of our body. Using barrier games with social communication is a great way of being able to highlight and then demonstrate the desired skill. 
So often you can have a student or yourself act as a stooge by purposely sabotaging the instructions to help the, the child and young person identify the skill that they need to change or support. So you may purposely not look at the young person, you might turn your body away, you might interrupt or talk over. And then using support of the Listening Larry poster, which is the Michelle Garcia winner, um, whole body listening poster, you can ask the young person to actively identify which skill do you think I need to change there? What's showing you that I wasn't listening and how can I change this? Then you get the young person from their perspective and what's natural to them to correct that behaviour. So on this slide, we want to talk about Lego therapy. Many of you may already be familiar with Lego therapy and often use this already to develop children's social communication. So in Lego therapy, there are three distinct roles and the therapy is done in groups of three children. So there are three roles within Lego therapy, the engineer, the supplier and the builder. All young people throughout the course of Lego therapy will get a turn at each role. And you can offer reassurance to the children that this will happen, as often they all want to be the builder. So, the engineer gives the instructions based on a photo of a Lego tower or model. If you have simple models that um, are more motivating, please do use these as well. So, the engineer tells the supplier which bricks to get and to give them to the builder. For example, get a red brick and give it to the builder. They also give instructions to build a light, put the yellow brick on top of the big red brick in the middle. And you can adapt the complexity of the model to be based on the child's level. So the supplier, they listen to what bricks the engineer tells them to get and gives them to the builder. And then the builder builds the model following the instructions from the engineer. As the supporting adult, we often will want to demonstrate encouragement of social functional phrases. So, for example, I've done it, I'm ready, what's next? And then waiting for the builder or supplier to finish before moving on. The engineer must give all the details needed for the listener to follow the instruction. So this really does work on listener awareness and social perspective taking. Lego therapy also supports receptive and expressive language. So following and giving instructions, seeking clarification, so that active listening that we've been referring to earlier, and visual support can also be used if needed. So you might want visual support, one, for asking help, so the I've done it, I'm ready, or what's next, um, I'm not sure of that instruction, or uh, visual support for the actual language needed for Lego therapy, so symbols for the colours, the sizes, prepositions and concepts. On this slide, you can see an example of that visual support. So children with language difficulties are likely to find it hard to structure a sentence in the form of an instruction and know which words to use in which order. So the children and young people are to be encouraged to use and point to the symbols on the visual support to help structure their expressive language. So for example, put the little blue brick on the red brick on the left. So often active listening can be included in barrier games and that seeking and clarification is encouraged throughout the barrier games. So the general phrases that might be used are, can you say it again, please? Can you say it more slowly? I'm not sure what that word means. Um, obviously, specific clarification depends on the activity. So for the Lego, it might be, did you say a big red brick? And again, having visual support for seeking clarification is often recommended alongside. So they'll have the visual support for supporting the requesting for help and a visual support for the giving and following of instructions. Barrier games can also be used to support children with their speech sounds or pronunciation. So you can use them to help the child to hear the difference between sounds and sounds within words. Practice saying tricky individual sounds and practice saying their tricky sounds in words and within sentences. A very common example of a speech sound error in children is a child who says t instead of k. So they might say t instead of key or net instead of neck. So initially you would want to use a barrier game to check that they can hear the difference between those two sounds. 
both in isolation, so both the t and the k sounds by themselves, and when those sounds appear in words, because if a child isn't able to hear the difference, they won't be able to produce the difference. And then you can use a barrier game to help them produce those sounds accurately, both by themselves and in words. So we're going to show you some examples of how to do that next. This is an example of some resources that you can use in a barrier game to check if a child can hear the difference between two sounds that you're trying to work on. So in this example, you would be working with the child and you would both have a symbol for t and a symbol for k on your side of the barrier. And you could use any, any resources. So for example, let's say you were using pop-up pirate to make it more fun. So you would each have a selection of swords and you would say to the child, put a sword on the t sound or put a sword on the k sound. And then before you let the child put the sword in the barrel, you would lift the barrier up and just check that you've both put it in the same place. If you haven't put it in the same place, that might suggest that the child is finding it tricky to hear the difference between those two sounds. Once you know that the child is able to hear the difference between the two sounds, they could have a go at practicing saying them and making sure that they're distinguishing between them clearly when they're saying them. So they could then have a chance to say to you, put a sword on k or t. And then you lift the barrier and see if you've done it the same. And that helps them to understand when they have or haven't said that sound correctly. So a more specific way of developing speech sounds through barrier games is using minimal pairs. So a minimal pair is two words that differ by just one sound and this makes the words differ in meaning. So for example, key, t. So that's working on the k and the t. This can be used to develop the child's awareness that if they use the incorrect sound, the complete meaning of the word changes and therefore they may not be understood, e.g., Pass me the T versus pass me the key. So to make these activities more motivating, we use games such as Pop-Up Pirate, the Hanging Monkey game, where you've got like the monkeys on the trees or counters. So each of the items would be on a picture and you might be able to, you might say, can you get me the monkey on the key, on the key? So you're getting them to listen first, to hear the difference in the sounds so that they pick the right item so they're listening for the, the target sound. Then you can switch it to expressive so the child is asking for you to pick up or search for the item so they might say find the key, find the key but actually they mean the T. So again highlighting that listening um, to production awareness. And you can contrast any two sounds that the child is confusing so for, again for example P versus B, so pin versus bin, or S versus D, sad versus dad. So the next step up would be practicing sounds and sentences. So the child would practice their new sound, so for example, P, in simple instructions. So can you colour the pink pig? Hopefully today we've given you a few ideas and um, resources of what you can use to support your children and young people with active listening and barrier games.